Hi, everybody. It's Nancy Reyes with For Your Canine. And Joanne Swicky with For Better, For Worse. Uh, let us know you're out there. Uh, today, we have a really great uh, special guest, and we're really excited about this topic. For anybody who does any dog sports, whether it's agility, nose work, barn hunt, doesn't matter. Or you just want to have your dog uh, in good shape and um, ready to go and have a more less vet bills and more <laughs> and more um, quality of life. Uh, this is going to be a, a great uh, uh, Facebook Live for you today. Uh, today we have hi Jen, hi Sue, Patty, how are you? Hi Nancy, Karen. Yes, everybody's really <laughs> been looking forward to this one. Um, so we're gonna. Uh, introduce our guest is Erica Bowling. She's a canine fitness specialist, amongst many other talents she has. Okay. Uh, but but uh, tonight we're going to uh, zone in on uh, her specialty when it comes to canine fitness and how to keep your dog healthy and fit um, for a long, happy life. So Erica, could you tell us a little bit about you and how you yes. get into canine fitness? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm the owner and founder of a Northeast Canine Conditioning and Northeast Canine Conditioning Academy. Um, I, not too long ago, left the university, a retired associate professor, um, and I followed my passion and uh, am doing what I love, canine fitness. It all started, though, when my own dog got injured. I have a Belgian Mal I have two Belgian Malinois, and uh, many years ago, with my first one, I was competing in a protection sport called French Ring, and he, oh, about a, a little bit less than a year old, he was having very sporadic lameness, but it was like he would limp once or twice, and then he'd be fine. And he would be sleeping and get up. And it was almost like his leg fell asleep. He'd limp once or twice, and then he would be fine. And he would never, ever limp during training, he would never limp right after training. And it was just, he'd go weeks and be fine. And then he would start limping. And uh, it took me about 10 months and multiple veterinarians to finally get a diagnosis. And he had a muscle pull. Um, some of you, if you do sport sport dog activities, you might be familiar with the ilias psoas injury. I know a mm -hmm. lot of people that I know of in the sport dog world, some working dog people have had that with their dogs. And what happened was when we were rehabbing him, I was just eating up as much of the information as I could. And I started to realize that months before he was injured, there were all kinds of signs he had been giving me, not lameness, but other things that he had been showing me. And I missed them all because of a lack of education. So I learned number one is I needed to learn more to keep him fit. And number two is this is an injury that frequently reappears again and again, if you don't deal with it correctly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to learn as much as I could to prevent this injury from happening again. So it all started out just to keep my own dogs fit and healthy and to prevent injury. And then it just grew from there. People would see me, um, I would learn and study, get as much information as I could. And then people started asking me, what are you doing? And why are you stretching your dog? And why are you doing a warm up? And can you show me how to do it? And then it just grew from there to doing workshops and seminars and then uh, online courses. I have an online academy and uh, it just all kind of sprouted from that. But, you know, it, it's interesting because I was just devastated when it took my dog almost a year for a full recovery. And um, I was just devastated, but out, out of that injury came this um, amazing uh, business and a whole new lifestyle that I have um, because of it. But that, that, was, that was what started all was an injury. <laughs> wow, yeah. And it, it's, it's sad or difficult when that happens, right? When you have that. Um, but those, um, I did agility for many years. Um, a lot of the people listening uh, do agility as well. Uh, so they're very familiar with that particular injury and, um, and, and many others. And a lot of us spend a lot of money <laughs> uh, keeping our dogs, you know, with chiropractic care and all that stuff. So, but you, you offer a little bit of a more holistic approach and also stuff that everybody can do at home and things like that. So that's why I, I thought uh, this would be a, a great topic. So um, I know there's, uh, uh, Erica has a lot of, of giveaways and stuff like that, or pages of a lot of information. So we will share those as we go uh, throughout the, the evening. And also feel free to ask questions. I see a lot of your agility folks are, and also in nose work also, while it's not a, as physical as French ring and agility, 
dogs still have to be in good condition to do that as well. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I, I'll just add a quick thing about the nose work is there's a solid research, uh, a lot of research to support that when, you're, when your dogs are in top physical condition, not only do they search better, they have better stamina, but their searching is more accurate. So the accuracy of the surge can be impacted on if your dog is fit or not fit or carrying extra weight on them. So even though we might think about, oh, well, you know, it's not super physical, the dogs might be on a lead, on a harness, walking, maybe jogging, but um, people instantly might not think about the need for that physical fitness, but it directly has a connection to your dog's searching ability and the accuracy and the stamina of the search. So it's really important just as much for those dogs as for the dogs that are doing very physically demanding sports. It's just they there's kind of different benefits that you get out of it. Um, yeah. yeah, that's super, super important for, for them. Yeah. Too. Well, because a lot of people, because it's nose work, they think, oh, they're just walking on a leash and all yeah. that. And and truth is that the lower levels is maybe not as big of an issue, but at the higher levels in Noseworth, it is a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more of a, a big, but even still, if you start, if you get started on some good habits early on, I think um, over time that'll, it, you know, you're, it's just, can, the dog can only get better. Definitely. Especially those of us that are weekend warriors and don't uh, uh, <laughs> keep them fit all the time. Um, so, so the, so let's start with, um, how soon or how soon can you start a dog if you have a, a young dog or a puppy yep. um, in, you know, in getting them in condition? And what what does that mean when you have, you know, what, what kind of condition are you, ta are you talking every day, every other day? What are some of the things that yeah. people should be thinking about doing? So when you think about like a structured fitness program where you're going out and building cardio and building strength and things like that, the recommendation is typically that you don't do a structured fitness program until they are physically mature, until those growth plates are done, they're closed as far as doing repetitive type activities, you know, jogging distance with your dog. But a lot of people think, well, okay, that's great. That means I'm going to wait until my puppy gets older before I do anything. But there's actually quite a lot that you can do with the puppies, preparing them for when they get older. So there's a lot of kind of foundational activities that I'll do with the dog. Like number one, I'll start with my puppies are eight weeks old. And I teach things like um, just very foundational behaviors and how to use their body with good posture, how to sit squarely, how to do a nice balanced sphinx down. Um, even doing uh, foundational behaviors like targeting skills, because if they can target and hold their front feet on, say, a platform or, or a placement or hold their hind feet or know a stand command, um, know how to back up straight. These are behaviors that are definitely going to carry over whenever they get older and I can do a more structured fitness program. So I'll do a lot of things where I'm teaching them some of the kind of basic obedience that's going to carry over. Like for stretching, I like to, you can lure a dog to a stretch, but I also do a sustained hand target where I use my hand and they'll touch their nose to my hand and then I can hold it and, and just guide my hand and have them stretch. I can start teaching that when the puppy's eight weeks old. I can teach them a sustained hand target, targeting skills, standing, sitting squarely and using the body properly. Also things like uh, body awareness, balance, um, but keeping it really safe, you know, changing different types of surfaces, walking over things, crawling under things. When we think about puppies and growing dogs, we think of it more as self-directed play. You know, they should have activity every day, you know, short bursts of, of activity multiple times throughout the day. They need exercise for a proper development of their bodies, bones, tendons, and ligaments. But when it comes to any kind of, you know, repetitive exercises, um, you know, like I said, if you're jogging a few miles, riding your bicycle and out there taking your dog in a structured fitness routine, the, the, the rule of thumb there is to wait until the dogs are physically mature, but it doesn't mean that there can't be things that you do whenever they're puppies and to prepare them so that as they do mature, that they're going to be ready to take on those more advanced activities once their, their bodies are done, you know, kind of growing. Hmm. Well, that's, yeah, that's so interesting because <clears throat> in agility, you're not supposed to jump them until their growth plates are closed. But yeah, it, and it, usually most puppies, you have playtime and activity, but you don't really think about it as, well, you know, like that focus, right? So Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. 
All right. Joanne, do you have any other questions? Any because um, Joanne's big I on do. uh <laughs> on activity. So no, um, I, I, you know, one of our, our questions was also, you know, those of us that are, don't have much time, right? We're doing all sorts of, of things, uh, going to classes, teaching classes, working day jobs, whatever it is. Um, how do you, how do you incorporate that when you really don't have a, a, a lot of time, even for ourselves, to incorporate a fitness program, right? What, what are the, some of the ways that you can put that in? Yeah, one of the one of the first ways that really helps me because I like to go out to the gym, I like to exercise. If I don't get my exercise, like my mood, I can tell, <laughs> uh, you know, get more crabby, you know, le less patience. And so one of my favorite things to do is to exercise with my dogs. And one of the activities that I, I love doing is a sport called Canny Cross. And it's where your dog wears like a mushing harness and they're attached by, it's like a, a bungee line. It has a little bit of give and you wear a special belt that sits low on your hips and the dog is actually attached to you. Your hands are free, but the dog is attached to you with that belt. And as they're pulling, it pulls on your hips, you know, on, on the hip bones, right? On the pelvic bone and uh, the lower back, but further down so that it's not actually hurting the lower back and it sits low down um, kind of below your, your waist. And what happens is when I'm doing that, I can walk my dog, I can go jogging with my dog and he's pulling me and he's getting cardio exercise. He's getting resistance training there while we're doing it together. And I'm getting a workout and I can run faster. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, um, you know, that's one of the things that I love doing is going out. And then that way I don't have to go to the gym. You know, you, it used to be before I did candy cross is I would go to the gym one day and then the next day the dogs would get exercise. And the next day I would go to the gym and the next day they would get exercise because I couldn't, I didn't have time to do it all together. So, um, so that's one of the things I love about exercising together with my dogs is they get a workout and I get a workout together. And then we cut our training and workout time in half. Um, now, not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the physical, you know, bad knees or, you know, they, they, they can't get out and do that kind of exercise with their dogs. Um, other things that I do, number one is I make sure I, I, I schedule it into my week. And um, it, it's a priority for me. And so I make it a priority and I make sure I have time scheduled. For my senior dog, well, they're both, I guess they're both kind of seniors. My older dog, he's uh, almost 11 and a half. And I think for the older dogs like that, it's, I feel like it's even more important for our senior dogs, especially the large dogs, you know, medium to large dogs to keep them very as fit as possible. Because a lot of times when we end up having to put our older dogs down for the, especially for the larger dogs we can't carry around is when they lose mobility. And um, my past mm -hmm. couple dogs, that's my Doberman. I've had two Dobermans and both of them, that's, you know, they were like 11 years old and it was their mind was there. They had good health, but physically one had wobblers disease and the other one had some spinal issues, just degeneration of the spine. But it was actually it was the loss of mobility is why I had to put them down. And so for my seniors dogs and especially for my 11 and a half year old dog. I have, he has to get his exercise. I have to keep him as mobile as long as I can because he's nearly 80 pounds. When he can't get around on his own, I can't carry him around. And he's having some mobility issues. Um, and so for me, like it is a priority for me, for the longevity of my dogs and for their health and to keep them mobile and, and just physically fit and comfortable at, as they're young and as they age. So I make it a priority. I make sure I get him out at least like three times a week out to the park and walking and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that I'll do uh, when I'm short on time is I call it kind of like my um, living room or um, exercises from the couch. <laughs> and there's a lot that you can do from the couch. <laughs> and I will do things like if you're familiar with a fit pause equipment, mm -hmm. um, you can't do unless you have a treadmill, you can't really do the cardio from the couch. I can do a little bit of tugging and warm up exercise. I was doing that today with my one dog kind of tugging um, um, right in the living room, but I can't do any aerobic cardio in the house like that. I don't have a treadmill, but other things I can do though, I can do things like balance and body awareness, strength training. I can do that in my living room. 
and I'll use fit pause equipment. I'll do things where I have my dog do um, shoulder exercises. I'll have him do like a three legged stand and he does, he'll stand on three legs and he'll do like a high five. He'll do shoulder exercises. Mm. I do crawling. I make him, um, I was just doing it last night. I'll have him crawl forwards and crawl backwards and crawl forwards and crawl backwards. And I do it while I'm sitting on the couch in between commercials or watching the news. Um, I'll even put a piece of a, uh, like a fit bone or an exercise disc right there in the living room, just one piece of equipment. It doesn't take up a lot of space and I'll, um, I'll have him do some squats, some doggy squats where he does a sit, stand, sit, stand. Um, he even does this thing where he gets so excited. He'll go from a down to a stand, to a sit, to a down. And he actually like leaps in the air. He'll be in a down and he like leaps, you know, all four feet coming off the ground. And we'll just do those little, you know, these like little games in the living room. Um, and we're getting some strength training, some balance exercises, and we're doing it right there in the living room. Um, another thing that I'll do, um, I was doing this when my dog was rehabbing because we had to do some exercises for rehab multiple times a day. And what I did was I paired it with meal time. So that's a nice, quick, easy way as I would do his stretching exercises or some easy strength training exercises. Um, I feed them two to three times a day. So I knew that if I paired it, when I would feed them, then they would get at least two times a day, they would get those exercises. So mm -hmm. those are some of the, the I, and I know it's hard. Um, it's, you know, even for me, there's times where I'm like, oh, you know, you get lazy and you don't do it. But those have been the things that have helped me. And another thing is, ha if you have fitness equipment, make things very convenient because I used to have all my equipment upstairs and like I wasn't using it. I mean, it was just go upstairs, all the equipment was in there and I never used it. <laughs> I brought it down and put it in the living room and just the convenience of it sitting there in the living room that I used it more frequently, just having it right there next to the couch. Yeah. So, you know, just something simple like that, just convenience. Uh, I have a really nice basement here and I was going to turn the basement into this, you know, workout area, but like, I never go in the basement, <laughs> and, you know, and it's like cold and cement. And I had this big plans when I moved to this new house, you know, and I'm like, I had all this new equipment and I never went into the basement. I never used it. So I ended up putting my fitness equipment in my office. So now I've been more consistent in using it because I'm in my office every day and, um, and that helps. So finding a routine and if you can, um, a great way to build new habits is they call what's called a triggering event. You attach the exercise to a cue, something that you do regularly on an ongoing basis that is your signal to do your exercise. So for me, I've been really bad with my own exercise lately because the gyms are closed. So when I come back from taking my dogs out, my routine is before I get into the shower, I do my shoulder exercises or I can do my dog's shoulder exercises. So now I find that I'm much more consistent when I build that routine that I go to the park, come home, and I used to go straight to the shower. Well, now I go to the park, do my running, come home, shoulder exercises, then I shower. So mm -hmm. those are some some things that I find have been helpful for me to be consistent. Yeah, What are, uh, somebody asked about, what are the your favorite fit pals, uh, actually, like the, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's so many, but like, if you, if you could only buy one or two pieces, what would they be? Um, I like, um, I would say my go-to pieces are the, the, the larger size round disc, the blue, they might have different colors now, but the large size disc I find is more versatile. My dogs are medium to large dogs. So the large disc I find is more versatile. Um, I like the fit bones. I like to have two fit bones mm -hmm. because I like to do things where I put them end to end and we do lateral sidestepping. So we'll do lateral sidestepping on the front end, put the hind feet on it, walk sideways. And I find that I, there's just a lot more things I can do with the two fit bones versus one. So, mm -hmm. um, and then I love the Cavaletti. Um, if you're not familiar with the, they're like real low little jumps. Mm -hmm. Horses, they train horses with Cavaletti and they'll trot over them. And it's great for body awareness. And um, I would say those are the three things I'm kind of the most consistent and that I use the most in seminars and workshops would be the exercise disc, two fit bones and the Cavaletti are kind of go-to exercise equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, there's a lot of questions around ACL. So I'm going to try to come back and Joanne catch me, make sure I, I hit them all. Uh, somebody was asking about, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say, since there's a lot of questions around ACL, I will tell you, I had a dog that tore both. And the orthopedic surgeon told me almost 75 to 80 percent of ACL injuries are not actually injuries. They're caused by poor conformation. So, uh, Erica, I don't know if you would agree with that or not. Um, I know some strenuous activity can definitely cause um, ACL strain and tear, but go yeah, ahead. I mean, I, I don't know all the latest research on it. I'm not a veterinarian, so when we look at canine fitness versus the rehab side, there's you know, there's kind of they're two different disciplines. But um, I mean, definitely there are instances where, you know, I've, I've done some readings where sometimes they talk about the structure and the angulation of the, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the structure of the bones and the musculature of the dog. And some breeds seem to be have more of a tendency than others. Um, also, um, when you think about the sports or activities where there's a lot of, you know, twisting, turning, slipping, sliding, quick change of direction, um, you know, hard, intense activities, things like that can cause it, you know, where there's a slip slide um, and, and kind of trauma. Um, also, uh, when you think about uh, an imbalance of muscle strength. So mm -hmm. one of the things is you have, the, here's the challenge of the weekend warriors is they're not their body is not conditioned for intense activity because if you're only doing something once a week or once every two weeks, the body doesn't have time to adapt the muscles, the tendons, ligaments, the body, the, the cardiovascular system, you need to be consistent to make the body stronger. So what happens is you get a lot of dogs that are weekend warriors. They hang out at home during the week. They don't do a lot. And then I'll give an example like lure coursing. Um, they'll go out mm -hmm. on a Saturday and you've got a dog with potentially very high, high prey drive and the dog is going full out and the body has not had time to actually develop the strength needed to deal with that intense exercise. And so now you have high intensity, you have um, potential extra stress on the body, depending on the jumping, twisting, turning, mm -hmm. and then you're doing that on a body that is not conditioned. So that also can set a dog up for, you know, different types of injuries. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, if, if, if it's not structure, if it's not due to structure, I would look at things like, you know, what are some of the activities they're doing? Um, what is the conditioning of the dog? Are there imbalance, muscular imbalances in the dog and things like that, I would imagine are considerations, but. Somebody mentioned about uh, spaying and neutering uh, and ACL tears if they are, and I know there's some studies around it and I'm not sure what, um, that if you spay or neuter too, too early that there's a higher incidence of ACL tears, but I don't, I, I know there's studies on that, but I'm not positive. Um, um, I think, I think like you were saying, it's like, you have to give them that, get, get them conditioned no matter what, what, what you got, yeah. <laughs> whether they're, yeah. in. cause sometimes some of us are, have rescue animals that they're spayed and there's nothing you can do about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the best thing you can do is, you know, is prevent the injuries as much as you can by keeping your dog's body weight down. Don't let them get obese, keeping them fit and try not to be, I know it's hard, but try not to be that weekend warrior, especially if you're doing sport or work where the dog is doing very strenuous activities and they're only doing it like one day a week. The, the body's just not going to be conditioned for it if you're not, you know, doing it infrequently. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, and, and then if you do have the injury, um, I would try to work with the doctor that, you know, deals with these types of injuries frequently. And, and you work with a rehab specialist. I've talked to a number of people and their dogs have surgery. And then it's like, they just kind of turn them loose and there's been, there's no rehab program. So mm -hmm. I would say if there is an injury, you talk with your veterinarian and, and get a program or work with the physical therapist, they will know your dog. They will know the structure of the dog, the activities, the needs, you know, all of the issues. It's, it's very individualized, the program for the dog. And if your veterinarian does not give you kind of a strict outline of kind of, here's where we're starting. Here's what you're going to do weekly. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. You need to ask. I, I, I've worked with a lot of people, their dogs got injured and they'll come to me and I'll say, well, what did your veterinarian say about this, this and that? And they're like, well, they didn't say anything. I said, you need to ask or you need to find another veterinarian <laughs> um, oh, or a rehab specialist because 
if your dog uh, is going through surgery and being rehab, well, going through surgery and with this type of an injury, you need to have some kind of a rehabilitation plan to bring that dog back up to par. And you need to work with your veterinarian, people in the medical field, physical rehabilitation specialists, so that you know exactly what your the limitations are and what to follow. And that would be my recommendation um, if the dog has had a, um, an injury and has had uh, surgery. Yeah. Um, so the question was, I saw it, where did I see it? Um, so many questions. Uh, they asked about, oh, exercises that if you don't have equipment, like for building rear end awareness yep. um, for without, let's say you don't have um, a fit pause. But um, I think, you know, there's some extra, there's some things you can do to help with that, with that yeah. rear end awareness without yeah, I, I've done things like when my dogs are puppies, I teach them uh, front end awareness, hind end awareness. And I had like pasta bowls <laughs> like that you cook with and I put them upside down and my dog would put his front feet up on the bowl. I've, I've used shoe boxes where they put their front feet and the shoes were in it or else it would collapse. <laughs> and I would have them put their front feet and they would pivot and do the hind feet pivoting and body awareness and stepping over. I've done things where I've gone to the park and out, uh, one of the parks I always went to in the parking lot, it was outlined by like um, fallen telephone poles and it was just outlined the edge of the parking lot. And so I would put my dog and balance him on the, on, or it could be a fallen tree or part of a picnic bench. And I would have my dog stand and balance and do sit, stand, sit, stand down, walk forwards, walk backwards on that fallen telephone pole or fallen tree. And uh, I, I will use picnic benches where I'll put the front feet up on the where you sit on the picnic bench and I would do squats and they would do sit, stand, sit, stand or stand and do sideways stepping, strengthening the hindquarters. And I would do a picnic bench. Um, so I kind of look around the environment. I use stair steps, uh, use stairs mm -hmm. as, as a raised platform. I've also used a um, a when I was teaching my dog hind feet uh, targeting, I used a um, an inflatable, a queen size inflatable mattress. <laughs> so I set him up for success. I had this huge target, you know, and he's backing up crooked, but he hits the mattress and I would have him stand and balance on the inflatable mattress. And that was another thing that I've used. Hmm. Karen asked, going backwards upstairs at home. OK, or are those stairs? Going up the stairs backwards. That that's that's a um, thing up there, Karen. <laughs> yeah, I mean it. Number one is I would not do like I would anything with the stairs. I don't let them don't let them do fast. I don't I don't let them run up the stairs, run down. I've actually I think that might have been where my dog's injury first started because I remember he went to leap up the stairs and he yelped, and I think he was doing oh. full muscles. So um, anything on the stairs, I make them do slow, even just going up and down the stairs, slow and controlled. I block them so they can't go racing down up the stairs. And it's gonna, it will depend on the size of the dog, the size of the stairs, the steepness of the stairs. But doing, I will use stairs like uh, in my parents' house, I would use my office when I was visiting them in the upstairs and there was a doorway at the bottom of the stairs, right at the, the, the bottom. And what I would do for my older dog is I would let him walk down the stairs and he would just stand, um, you know, on a slant and just hold that before I would open the door. So it's putting more stress on his shoulders, you know, making him work those muscles more, but I'm not doing it a whole bunch of repetitions. I'm not doing it, you know, a zillion times going up 30 flights of stairs. So I think depending on the dog, depending on what you're doing, the steepness and, you know, the size of the stairs, there are, um, you know, I might do some hind end awareness that maybe I back up a few steps, but I'm not going to be like racing my dog up, you know, 25 steps mm -hmm. going up and down. But I, I think in moderation, depending on, like I said, the, the steepness, uh, the size of the step and what it actually you're asking the dog to do. I, I've used the stair steps, like I said, to help with my, um, my senior dog. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the biggest thing is, like I said, um, you're not, you don't want to do a lot of repetitive type stuff. You don't want to do, um, steep stairs and doing, you know, tons of steps and definitely don't do any of it fast. Yeah. Somebody asked about weighted vest. I have not heard about that. Well, yeah. I know people with the Huskies put stuff in theirs, but <laughs> yeah. in general for like, um, for fitness and training, anything that's like repetitive, high impact, I don't recommend uh, weighted vests because, um, you know, you're 
we're always trying to preserve the joints. We're trying to protect the joints. You know, we don't want our dogs to be overweight and carrying all that excess weight on their joints. And so, especially for high impact running, jumping, um, the likelihood of injury is higher if you're gonna be carrying this added weight. Also, if the weight is shifting around or moving around and you don't, you can't control exactly where that weight is equally distributed across the center of gravity of the dog. So for a weighted vest, I don't recommend, I feel like for strength training, there are much better and much safer exercises to do rather than doing a weighted vest. If you are going to do a weighted vest, please, please, please don't. I, I've heard of dogs running and jumping and leaping. You want to get an ACL injury, go put a weighted vest and have your dog leap up in the air and catch a ball. Like that, that is not something that, um, that I, I advocate and, and support. With that said, there are instances where I could, I, I won't say that I would never believe in putting weight on, on a dog because there are, in the ideal situation, I would say no. But there are instances, for example, police dogs, they have bullet, some police dogs carry bulletproof vests. Those vests are not light. Mm -hmm. If you have a police dog and your dog has to carry a weighted vest, a, a bulletproof vest all day long or part of the day during training, you need to condition for that. You can't just throw a bulletproof vest, a weighted vest on your dog that's never conditioned for it and expect it to, to handle it over a period of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that situation, I mean, ideally, you know, I wouldn't want a weighted vest on, but if they are going to wear one, if they're going to wear a bulletproof proof vest, I could see the argument for some conditioning to get them acclimated to it. Also, um, people that, you know, go hiking with their dogs and they're, you know, the dog's carrying its own water or the dog's carrying its own food. You know, it's not heavy, but there is something that it's carrying with it. Um, if you're, I know um, I had a woman, in, uh, she was in my program and she had a Huskies, Huskies or Malamutes? I think she had, um, it was one or the other. And she would go hiking. Sometimes they'd go like 50 mile hikes. You know, they go overnight mm -hmm. trips and stuff like that. And the dogs would carry, you know, carry stuff with them in their backpacks. And then something like that, I would say, okay, we need to condition them, but I would say condition them for the activity you're doing. If your dog is going to be carrying its food and water, then I would, on a, on a weekend hiking trip and you're hiking for three days, then I would recommend gradually, slowly building that up and not just all of a sudden throwing that backpack on your dog and all of a sudden hiking three days. Um, but, uh, definitely for any high impact running, jumping, trotting, I, I would not recommend putting the weighted vest on. Um, I prefer if you're going to do resistance training, I would prefer like canny cross where my dog has a mushing harness on and my dog is pulling and the weight is coming behind, you know, the resistance is pulling from behind versus coming straight down on the spine of the dog and on the joints in that direction. Um, but that's, that's, um, that's what I, I talk about in our elite canine athlete program when I teach about the canine fitness and, uh, and I have that also build in. So people understand it. if they, that's where I stand on it. And if they choose to do it otherwise, you know, they just have to accept whatever the outcome is. But, um, there are times also where I worked with a rehab specialist and we did use some weights for the rehabilitation but it was under the guidance of a veterinarian. So if there is a situation where you're rehab, rehabbing a dog and you're using some external weights putting on the dog, I would recommend working with a veterinarian or a rehab specialist to make sure that you're doing it properly. And, um, but that was an instance where I did do it, but it was with a veterinarian. They told me exactly uh, it was limited until the dog got stronger and then we took them off and then proceeded with our regular training. Yeah. And so what are some, going back to the ACL, what are some exercises you can do to, what's it's basically strength training, right? So yeah. Well, um, I'm not, as far as the medical side and the research, I'm not up on the latest research on the ACL, but I would say the biggest thing is prevent, preventing injury mm -hmm. would be, as I already said, excellent body condition, not having your dog overweight having a consistent regular fitness program that includes strength training that you do on a regular basis multiple times throughout the week. Those are the types of things that are going to help, help, you know, it's not going to guarantee that an injury is not going to happen, but it's going to help your dog um, be the best prepared to hopefully prevent an injury or if they are injured, if they're fit, 
when they're injured, they're going to bounce back faster than a dog that's not fit and then gets injured. Um, do you have anything specific that you would offer up for senior conditioning? It, it, yeah, I mean, it's totally going to depend on the, the, the dog because, um, you know, my senior dog, it, it's been a gradual progression of what he can and cannot do. And the, the biggest thing I would say is with the senior dogs, I find with my senior dogs, they literally, their abilities can change hourly. Like today he can be amazing. And tomorrow we can't even, you know, he might have one day where we go two miles and he's jogging part of it the next day. Like he he's stumbling and tripping and I can't even do a half mile. Um, and you know, there's one day that like, Yesterday in the snow, my older dog was like running in the snow. I can't even remember the last time he was running. And then uh, we we did a two miles the other day on a trail and he did really well. But a week ago, he was limping, um, not even a half mile into the trail and, and we came back early. And so with the older dogs, you know, the, they can have a good day, a bad day. They could be good in the morning. And, um, and then later in the afternoon, they're achy or they're achy in the morning. And then later on, they're not feeling so well. So one of the biggest things is you really have to have it individualized and customized to, for the dog and for the moment and be really in tune with what reading your dog and knowing, you know what, today we're not doing that hike or, you know, today maybe we can, um, we'll add a little jog for, you know, two minutes <laughs> or a minute and then we'll go back to a walk. So my senior dog before, um, I would say about a, a year ago, we were doing things like he would do squats. He'd put the front feet up on a, on a low brick wall. He'd do sit, stand, sit, stand. We would use equipment. Then he started getting to where if I use the equipment, he would start limping. So I can't use equipment with him anymore. And so I use things where, you know, walking and changing the terrain and helping him balance and walk on different surfaces and just trying to keep him as mobile and do as much body awareness as I can, but in a safe way. Um, you know, a, a year ago, um, I would do walk him on a trail with a lot of unsteady surface, you know, little bumps and stuff and the trail and he would be fine. Now it doesn't take much at all on the surface and he almost does a nose plant into the ground. So um, I have a mobility harness and sometimes I have to actually support him because he'll trip. And so it, you know, it's really hard to say because it's so individual by the dog and you just really have to kind of follow them and see what they're able to do. And when you see they're struggling, you need to back off. Mm -hmm. um, and also, try to keep them, you know, as mobile for as long as you can. Um, if your dog's not doing anything for three, four weeks, you can't expect them to just all of a sudden go out and then have them do two miles with you. Um, so I, I just kind of keep doing whatever I do with my regular program. And then as he starts to show that, you know, he can't do 10 repetitions anymore, he can only do two, or he can't balance on the equipment anymore. So now we're going to just work them on the ground. And I just really listen to him and I'm trying to be as consistent as possible and, um, you know, keep his body weight down, no extra fat. I keep him nice and trim, um, you know, make sure he's getting, you know, the right kind of nutrients and what he needs and just taking care of his overall health is what I do. Mm -hmm. So um, what mobility harness do you recommend? Lori asked. I think it's called the hold them up harness. Okay. The ones with the back. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my other two dogs, um, when they needed mobility help, they, I just used just, I can't remember the brand, but it was, it just had a handle towards the front. Mm -hmm. but, um, my, my older dog right now, he gets some knuckling over of the back toes and sometimes, um, well now he's starting to stumble in the front, but, um, I really like that hold him up because I would help him. I have a Suburban and um, and the hind end is where he's weak. And so I really like that handle on, on the hind end. And I used to um, get him in and out of the car. And then when I get to the park, I would unhook the back end. But then um, <laughs> one time he was, um, uh, we were on the trail and he had to quickly pee or, or poop and he quickly ran to the side and it was at an angle. And he squatted and then like he started falling backwards and I had the harness and I grabbed him and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I had the harness on or he would have, 
he, I could have just seen him some doing a somersault. It was just a little bit of an incline, but you know, he, his balance is not as good anymore. Um, but he, ever, ever since then, I keep the full harness on and I keep both <laughs> handles on. So if he stumbles, I can just, you know, grab him and support him. But um, uh, I, I really like the harness, especially if you need some support for the hind end. Um, and like I said, you can take it off or put it back on and it has the handle for the front and the handle for the back. I really like it. Mm. And uh, I, I think you already covered it. Sarah asked about <clears throat> how much exercise per day for cardio and overhaul. And I guess it depends um, if you can do it every day. Like you, you were, I know because Sarah joined a little later. So <laughs> um, just two or three times a week, you said, or three times a week, you said, right? Exercise for, the, for your dog. Well, just for people. It's going, it'll depend on the activity. Like for example, if I'm doing like regular cardio, if it's not super intense, like you might try to get your dogs out four or five, six days a week. If I'm doing strength training and it's advanced and more strenuous, then, you know, I might do two days a week of focused, you know, more intense strength training and then balance it off. So it's going to depend on a lot of the, the intensity and how difficult the exercise is. Um, you know, basic stretching, uh, dynamic stretching, um, some balance and body awareness things. I might do that on a daily basis. You know, if, if they're simple uh, teaching, um, I do a stretch from a tuck sit. They do a sit and a stretch and a sphinx down and a stretch. Um, when my dog was rehabbing from his injury, we were doing stretching and, and some of those strengthening exercises just from a sit and a down three times a day. So it's going to depend on the exercise you're doing and it will depend on the intensity of the exercise and, and what the dog's ready for. But I would say in general, like for my dog, for, for cardio fitness, I like to do like structured cardio at least three days a week. That's not saying he's not getting exercise other times of the day and other days of the week, but that's where I do like my structured cardio where we're going out, we're doing a few miles um, strength training. I might, if I want to do his shoulder exercises, I might try to get that, you know, at least twice a week. Um, but like I said, it's, it's also going to vary on some of the other exercises you're doing because, um, there's, for example, in my sport in, in uh, French ring, it's really strenuous on the dog. You've got, you know, cardio, you've got mm -hmm. strength training. So, you know, if I'm not doing my sport, I might add an extra day of strength training. If I'm doing my sport on a Saturday, Sunday, then I'm going to modify my training plan based on that. And I may cut back on some of my other strength training days because he just had a big weekend of training and it included a lot of strength in the sport that we're doing. So I'll modify it. Mm -hmm. so, so do you Go ahead, Joanne. Speaking of French ring, right? Could you could you maybe walk us through like what what is your prep? What is your what do you do? Do you get him out, walk him around, do some stretches? I mean, could you just give us kind of an idea of what you do before your sport? Yeah, um, I'll get him out of the car, and then um, if they have to be on leash, what I'll do is I'll walk them and pretty quickly get them into a trot. And then I'll do, I like to get like a 25, 30 foot lead where I'll have some uh, touch pads, like some target touch pads. And um, after he trots around, I teach my dogs to lunge like a horse. So I can put them on like a 25 foot lead and um, lunge them in circles and counterclockwise and clockwise trotting and cantering. And I can do that on lead. Another thing I'll do is I'll put them in like a, 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 on a touch pad or a sit stay. I'll go out to the end of the leash and then I'll have like another touch pad further out. So if I have a, say a, a 20 foot lead, then I stand in the middle, I can have them sprint and do like 40 feet back and forth. So I'll start um, gradually building up the heart rate by increasing the intensity from a walk to a trot to a short sprint, you know, not super far, and then gradually increase that. Um, uh, if I have him off leash, I'll also, I'll do the same thing. I just may extend more distance as he gets more warmed up. Um, I'll do some tugging with him. Also in, um, in my sport, the way my dogs, uh, guard the decoy is, um, they actually are, their nose goes like in the crotch <laughs> of the decoy. So they're like facing the decoy and the decoy, when he walks forward, the dog is walking backwards. So um, in the sport, my dogs do a lot of backwards walking. So that would be like a sport specific warm up. Since they do it when they're training in my warm up, I do backwards walking, some tugging with a bite pillow, um, uh, warming up the you know the neck, the jaws, and that'll be more sport specific. So um, I basically will start walking, trotting, jogging, and then um, get in 
get the intensity up, get the heart rate going, get them more warmed up, then I can start adding some sprinting to it. Um, and then I might even, if I have somebody there to, you know, give them a couple, you know, right real close, I'm not going to send them running down a field. I might give them a couple bites, um, with the decoy before I go into, into the ring. Um, in French ring, the very, very first exercise you do when you enter the ring is the jumping and the jumping, you can do up to a 1.2 meter hurdle. And there's a palisade wall. That's like, I don't know if it's like six and a half, seven feet high. So, and then, and there's a broad jump. So it's like some of the most physically demanding things you do the minute you walk into the ring. So your dog has to be really well warmed up um, to go in and all of a sudden be jumping a 1.2 meter hurdle. And a lot of times that's the very first thing they do is that hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so those are, that's an example of some of the things that I will do. Um, and I'll also build in some obedience where I'll have them, um, do some healing and go spin to a front and do some healing and tugging and transitioning. And the main thing is I just keep them moving, keep them moving, changing positions. And I'll throw in the tugging and the obedience to keep his mind focused on me so that once we walk in the ring, he's still focused on me and, and paying attention. Hmm. And, uh, Pat, Pat Tiernan mentioned about uh, doing the uh, canny cross or running downhill. Yeah, you'd have to definitely be in condition to do that for sure. Uh, if you don't have the yeah, you you can't do it. Uh, you don't have everybody thinks like you have to go running. Like no. you can do the equipment. You can go walking with your dog and build in some resistance training, have your hands free. And you don't, people think, oh, but I don't run. You don't have to, you don't have to run and your dog's gonna get some resistance training and be building some strength through it. Um, I have a Facebook group. We had a lot of people that were doing it for the very first time and they started out doing candy. They would just be for two minutes and then they'd walk and then they'd jog for two minutes. And next thing you know, over months, these people were then running a mile and then they were running two miles, but they started by going out and just walking with their dog or hiking with their dog, but letting the dog have that pulling equipment on so that you're building also some resistance. I think also um, when I'm doing that, I'm more balanced because my hands are free versus if the dog is on a leash on the left hand side and it throws me off balance and I have herniated discs in my lower back. And I find that when I'm using the leash or I'm off balance or jogging, I'm not using my hands equally because one side has the leash. Mm. I find that that actually starts to aggravate my lower back. So one of the things that I love about if I'm gonna just go out for a walk with them and if I have the canny cross equipment is I'm nice and balanced, my hands are free and I'm getting a workout and my dog, like I said, if he's not, if he's not running, okay, maybe you're not getting that full cardio workout, but you can definitely build in some resistance there and build in some strength if the dog's pulling. Yeah. Well, and the truth is, if you haven't done it with your dog, you're going to have to start, even if you even your dog may not be in, in the best condition to, you're going to start slow anyway. So, yeah. Um, so Carrie, Carrie, I know has sight hounds. And so she's asking, I don't know if you have any thoughts um, do you use any kind of special foods or supplementation for like recovery on like a lure coursing dog or agility or your French ring? Do you, do you have anything that you would add into your program? Um, yeah. yeah, I use, um, I use uh, animate dog food has, uh, is for post-exercise recovery. It's called glyco charge. Um, I've used that for my dog. Um, I used to use canine super fuel. Um, this was a number of years ago and it had, um, it had a coconut oil in it. And there's some research studies showing that the coconut oil was affecting the dog's um, detection capabilities. And so when I started doing some detection work with my dogs, um, I stopped giving it to them. I don't know if it's still in the ingredients. This was a number of years ago, um, but um, that was one that I used to use and I was happy with. It was just with the, when I started the detection work, I switched. Um, glyco charge is another. Um, Nutrical, I have one dog and his blood sugar sometimes can, and when he's in the veterinarian's office, he has his blood sugar is like a low normal. But then when he works like really, really hard, really intense, um, it, it can dip. And so I've also used like Nutrical, it's kind of like runners when you have your energy gels, where sometimes if he's working really strenuously, I'll just kind of squirt, it's like a, like a gel in a tube. Yeah 
squirt it in his mouth and he'll get a little bit of that, um, you know, during in between exercise and stuff for recovery. And those are some of the things that I've done. I don't do it every time. I do it just when he's working really, really hard and we're needing like a boost to the system to, to recover. Um, if you are doing some kind of post-exercise recovery supplement, um, research shows that if you get it in their system within 20 minutes or so, 20 to 30 minutes, their body's going to absorb it better um, than if you wait. And so, um, I mean, they'll still get the benefits if you get it like an hour or so later, but if you are doing it specifically to recover and you're going right back out or the dog's working really hard, ideally you want to get that into them, like I said, within 20 minutes or so into their system. Mm. Um, so how did you, uh, somebody asked about how to teach the dog to lunge. Um, what I do is I kind of walk, I use start with a shorter leash and I kind of walk with them in the circle. I don't just stand, but I kind of guide them and I use the leash kind of guiding them and I, I cluck and use my voice and kind of even wave my hand like, come on, let's go, let's go. And I use a lot of encouragement with my voice and kind of guiding them and leading them mm -hmm. and walking with them. And then um, as the le as the line would get longer, sometimes what I would do is I would start walking with him down the field and he would start walking and then I, I would slow down and he'd kind of pass me and then I would turn around and then he'd be like, oh, she turned around and then he would turn back and do another kind of half circle. But um, what I would do is I wouldn't expect him to just trot a circle with me right away is I would kind of walk the inside of the circle with him, kind of guiding him along. And I will say, if your dog is really, really ingrained to doing that focused heel on your left, <laughs> um, it can be really hard to get them off your side because they're just like, wait a minute, you know, you've spent years teaching me to stay next to you and now you're telling me to go out away from you. And that's the same with the candy cross. You know, the dog's like, wait, you, you know, you told me for years I'm supposed to stay at your side. Now you're telling me I can go in front. <laughs> um, so, um, so I do find sometimes, especially if you, if your dog has been doing years and years of just this focused healing on the left, it can be challenging to kind of get them off that, uh, out of that position. Um, but, uh, I, I do find that my dog in one direction, they'll do a little bit of, of a better circle. And then on the other side, I do have to walk with them a little bit more and guide them. And it is on that left side. Veer out away from me a little bit further. Um, but that, that's how I do it. Yeah. Carrie, um, I did see that about the coconut oil. Um, right, Joanne, at one of the, I think we, I, I came back from one of the detection conferences and it's coconut oil that actually helps the sniffing ability, not the coconut oil. So yes, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, uh, that was, that's a study that they did. And I, I was very surprised that corn oil actually <laughs> is corn. very helpful uh, the corn. For, for, for sniffing. So I thought that was pretty, um, pretty interesting as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting because I, I had been doing dabbling a little bit at the time with my other dog with some scent stuff. And I read that and I sure enough, I went and I was like looking at the ingredients and I was like, oh, <laughs> there's some coconut oil in there. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, the, the glycocharge last time I checked, um, it did not have it in it. So hmm. uh, what do you feed your do you do you, you feed your dogs kibble or raw feeding or? Um, I have, well, I have, um, I have a dog that has a special diet because he has, um, he's had a uh, cysteine stones, um, his body produces it, there's really no way to stop it. And so he's on a prescribed diet, it's a kibble. Um, he has to basically have very, 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 very low protein because his body doesn't process the protein correctly. And we actually had to have emergency surgery uh, mm -hmm. about two years ago for the cysteine stones. He had hundreds of them and his body just produces it. So he's on a very, very, very strict diet. I don't put, he doesn't get those extra supplements because almost everything has some kind of protein in it or, um, but he's on a, on a prescription diet for his cysteine stones and uh, has been doing really well on it. Um, my other dog, um, I switched him. Um, he was on He was on kibble and when he was younger, he had like, when I got him, a lot of loose stool. Um, I kept switching, trying to find something that his stomach would deal with. I found a, um, a food that he actually did better with, 
And then he started having some itching problems. And then I tried to switch him to raw. He had more stomach issues. And then I switched him back to a kibble. The itching stopped <laughs> and, um, and his stools got better. So for him, it's like I've done a lot of trial and error. And then when I finally found something that, you know, he just seems to handle well, that's what I stayed with. So mm -hmm. he's, um, he's on a kibble right now. But I've, I've gone through different things from stomach issues. I've tried stuff also with the, um, with the raw, and then he had some issues with the uh, skin being, being itchy. And I just found that kibble is what his system has been doing best with right now. Yeah. Um, and then I, I do, like I said, I do do the supplements um, when they're exercising, they get stuff for their joints, they get a uh, relactin oil and they get uh, joint supplements. Um, and then also, uh, if some, there's a recent study out, there is a supplement called um, Myos, M-Y-O-S, and it's a protein uh, supplement. It's real, real high in protein that um, there's been a, research, a recent research study showing the effectiveness of it on um, building strength and building muscle. And my older dog that has the mobility issues, I started giving him that and I saw a distinct improvement in his strength. Ooh. Um, M Y O S. Um, and what happened was, um, it takes, it can take about four weeks or so to start seeing improvement. And the only thing I changed with his diet was I was giving him the myos. And after he was on it for about eight weeks, he actually, um, his mobility and balance had, you know, is not good has been deteriorating. And he started, he went to actually scratch his head with his back leg, standing and balancing on three legs. I had not seen him do that, have the strength or the balance to stand on three legs and to scratch himself with the hind leg. I can't, I couldn't even remember the last time I'd seen him do that. And, um, and it was that the only thing I changed was I started giving him that supplement mm -hmm. and I started seeing um, him stronger in the hindquarters um, like I said, he would, um, he started to lift his leg to pee, which he hadn't done in a long time because the balance was, you know, his, his strength and the hind end was, you know, not good. And, um, and I was like, you know, I don't think I'm imagining it. I really feel like he's getting stronger. And then they recently had a research article come out about that. And they did, it was a, um, a study that they did and they did see that the dogs were um, doing well and, and, and they were seeing an improvement with the myos. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, Terry and Tim, yes, there was a study done. This is a, quite a few years ago about the coconut oil, and uh, and it inhibits their uh, something about the oil inhibits their sniffing abilities. Incredibly, corn oil of all things uh, mm -hmm. enhances their sniffing abilities. So if you're doing nose work, corn oil is what you should add to their diet, which is really the yeah. thing, like they've been telling us to stay away from that forever. But that seems to um, help the dogs with their sniffers. Um, and I actually did a little test with my own dogs. I don't know, Joanne, did you do a... Uh, um, no. I, I did. I took them off the, the coconut oil and did that. And, you know, I, I think I saw a difference, but not, not enough. But I still keep them on the coconut oil for their skin and all that stuff. And then I do, um, I alternate it with corn oil. So um, that's kind of how I manage it. I don't know. If it's right or wrong, but yes, there's quite a bit of extensive study on on corn oil on that for nose work, which is interesting. It's, it's very interesting, yeah, because it's like corn oil. It's like you know, stay away from it, and then now they're like, no, no, it's great for the dogs. <laughs> and a, a while ago, I think it was about two years ago or so, the big thing was like coconut oil, coconut oil, coconut oil, and you know, they're talking about it for the humans and for the dogs. Um, and it was about that time when I when I learned about that research study. So yeah, yeah, I, I think I learned about it at the CNCA conference, um, yeah. a few quite a few years, maybe three about three years ago. There was a lot of study on that. So, yeah. um, um, okay, Joanne, any other questions? I know you're. Um, no, I, I think one of the last things that I would want to know is like, what would be some of the biggest challenges in developing a fitness program? Like, what are some of the biggest uh, pitfalls or, or, or challenges you see? Yeah. Um, when it comes to developing a fitness program is uh, a, a couple things that I see is people aren't doing a balanced program. They'll kind of, especially if they're doing sport, they're kind of 
fanatics and you do a lot of your sport. And even though you're training a lot in your sport and it's helping in the sport, you're developing imbalances. You know, you're doing a lot of cardio, you're ignoring stretching. You're doing a lot of weight pulling, you're ignoring cardio. And what mm -hmm. happens is without having a balanced fitness program where you're doing strength training, um, body awareness, stretching, anaerobic, aerobic cardio, if you're not trying to balance that out throughout the week, you're developing imbalances and those imbalances are developing weaknesses. So one of the things I see is either dogs aren't getting enough exercise period and you know, wa walking around the neighborhood and not even getting the heart rate up and, and um, you know, not going you know, maybe two, three times a week, like that's just not enough. I would say you know, we're having, we're in the midst of an obesity epidemic for humans and dogs. And the general population out there, the biggest thing is they're not getting out and they're not consistent in getting regular exercise for their dogs. Um, the, the people that are out there and are doing a lot of um, exercise and a lot of training, what I see is um, it's not a structured, balanced fitness program. And so they're actually building imbalances into their program they're building and and you know you've seen things like overuse injuries or you see a lot of you know uh lower back stress a lot of working dogs the lower back is where you see issues a lot of tightness and they're working a lot and a lot of stress and they're not getting the the massage and they're not getting the the, the stretching so mm -hmm. um so those are, are are two two of the things that i see um the other thing i see is when people do kind of get on a health kick <laughs> and they'll be like, oh yeah, we're going to, you know, get serious about fitness is they'll do too much too soon or be very sporadic about what they're doing. And so the dog isn't having a chance to kind of advance and, um, mm, yeah. and the, the, the weekend warrior, you know, they'll either not do enough or they'll go out and do a whole bunch of, you know, one or two days and the dog's not ready for it, or they're, they're doing too much too soon. And that's setting the dog up for injury. I see this more in the sport dog world and the working dog world where you'll see that happening more of the weekend warrior syndrome, um, for the general pet population, I would say the biggest challenge is people just out, they're, they're not getting their dogs out there getting exercise on a regular basis and um, and their dogs are you know overweight feeding on too much I, I find the general typical average pet owner and not just pet I even see in the sport and the working dog owners a lot of times they don't know what a proper body weight is and so you see a dog that is nice and fit and they'll be like oh your dog's so skinny like all my all my family members, um, they, they like think my dogs, like their dogs might be overweight and they think their dogs are fine. And they think my dogs are too skinny, <laughs> um, because you know, they, they, they don't do the things that I do and they don't have the background and, you know, they don't see, um, it's a lot of times people don't see what a, a fit and trim dog looks like. And so the general population, they'll, they'll think their dog is fine. And I'm like, no, actually your dog needs to lose some weight here because your, your mm -hmm. dog's overweight. Um, so people are, um, they're not exercising them enough. Um, they're, they're feeding them too much. Um, and dogs are carrying a little bit too much extra weight. And then, like I said, on the other end for the people who are doing a lot, um, trying not to avoid the weekend warrior, trying to build up stuff throughout the week. So they're not just working hard one day a week and then, um, building a balanced program so that you're working on all these different components and you're customizing it to the needs of the dog in front of you. Um, and different sports and different activities are going to have different demands on the dog's body. So I've had some people, um, they want me to just kind of hand over, well, you know, can you give me a fitness program, you know, for a beginner dog or an advanced dog? And I don't know their dog and they want me to just hand over a fitness program. And I'm like, well, I can't tell you what to do because number one, I don't know your dog. I don't know your dog's body condition. I don't know your activity you do, right. your expectations. So a search and rescue dog is going to have a different fitness program than a lure coursing dog. And uh, a German shepherd is going to have a different program than a breed that is more square, more, you know, um, more muscular um, and, and, and built differently. And also depending on the activity they do, if I have a protection sport dog, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on that lower back and I'm gonna do core. I'm gonna be thinking of the front end and the neck and the spine. Um, when I think about agility, I'm going to be thinking more so also about the shoulders. So these are the things that um, mm -hmm. I don't believe in just kind of handing over a generic fitness program and saying, yeah, you know, here, here's a beginner program or do people always ask me on my Facebook live shows, you know, 
Um, what should I do for this and that with my dog? And it's like, I, I need like an hour conversation and to see videos and photos and, and learn who your dog is and what your goals are and to see your dog do a gait analysis, do uh, look at your dog's body condition um, and look at what are you currently doing with your dog. Then I can start to talk about what you should be doing, but only after you get all that information. So, right. um, and, yeah. and Tony, you asked about uh, walking and stretching. I think stretching is a big, is a big thing for, every for any sport or any dog just in general yeah i would say um number one is warming up your dog that's another thing um one of the quickest and easiest ways to help prevent injuries if you're doing sports and activities is warm up your dog and make sure you're warming up not just pulling them out of the car warm up your dog and then also cooling them down um the I, I, I talk a lot about dynamic stretching where you're kind of luring the dog into a stretch position. You're not manually taking the dog's leg and pulling it into a certain position. There's research on humans where they've looked at doing static stretching, passive static stretching, where you're actually using an external force on the body to hold the stretch. And they found that if it's not done properly, stretching could actually create an injury. And they've done some studies where stretching the dogs, I mean, the, the humans actually perform worse when they did those static stretches. And so um, because the dog is not as readily, you know, there to say, hey, wait a minute, you've reached that point of, you know, don't stretch any further. And, right. um, you know, I prefer to do more of the dynamic stretching. And before exercise, I actually put most of my energy on just a really, really good warm up. And then I will do more dynamic stretching and massage um, afterwards to help kind of elongate those muscles. But if you think about it, like if, and this has happened when I would go to the physical therapist and they're manipulating your body and you're supposed to be relaxing and you don't even think about it and you're tightening your muscles. And he's like, no, relax your muscles. And he's trying to stretch my, my lower back. Well, if you're taking your dog and you're lifting the paw or pull, pulling the leg, you know, a lot of times that first reaction is to actually contract the muscles, not relax the muscles. Oh. And so um, sometimes I see people doing stretching. They think they're stretching, but the dog's actually... Uh, like stretching, if you're balancing on unstable equipment, like put your dog on a fit bone and you're stretching. Well, if your dog is trying to balance and hold its body still, it's actually contracting muscles. Mm. So while it's tightening these muscles and trying to balance and hold its balance and you're trying to stretch it, I, I say, if you're going to stretch your dog, get it on a solid surface, you know, do massage on the ground. But if your dog is trying to maintain posture and hold the balance, he's actually is going to be contracting some of those muscles rather than relaxing. So, um, so I, I actually feel like um, more, I place more emphasis on a really, really good warm up, And um, I might do some dynamic stretching and spins and stuff as part of the warm up. But then I focus, I like to combine for flexibility doing that um, with uh, massage and dynamic stretching. And I'll do a lot of that afterwards to try to um, get more of that kind of relaxing of the muscles, loosening of the muscles post-exercise. Mm, okay. Um, uh, Erica also has, and I'm going to put it on the comments, a, a um, winter prep. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? It's a little handout. So now it, you, you guys can click on it and um, download it about getting ready for winter and for uh, fitness. Yep. And I just put another link in there. You can share with them. It's called the canine fitness quiz, but um, yep. I just did this. Uh, it was a Facebook live show I did about uh, a week and a half ago. And uh, I live in Maine. And uh, when you're, I do a lot of activity outdoors and I do a lot of activities outdoors by myself with my dogs. So when you're dealing with freezing temperatures and freezing weather, and I used to do um, search and rescue. So I'm very much in kind of a safety mode and make sure you're prepared. And so um, when I'm going out um, hiking with my dogs or jogging or snowshoeing or going into Katy National Park and you're getting in freezing temperatures, um, I feel like there's some special considerations of things you need to do and to have and equipment and things to carry in your backpack to be prepared and um, be safe when you're out there in the winter doing activities outdoors with your dogs. And um, right now, um, I was just thinking about this today. I was like, one of the things I'm kind of grateful for that I'm that would not be happening um, if it weren't for COVID is 
you know, today it was like, you know, 26 degrees, cloudy, gray. And I went out and did four and a half miles in, in the park in the snow. And um, I was thinking if it weren't for COVID, I would have gone to the gym, you know, it would have been more convenient. But because of it, COVID, it's pushing me, you know, I'm outdoors, no matter the weather, um, mm. if there's ice or snow, I just make sure that I'm prepared, I have the right equipment, my dog has the right equipment, and I have the right equipment, so that we can safely engage in outdoor exercise together. So, um, so that, uh, that link that you put in there, will take them to the video replay to the Facebook live show where mm. I went over some of the um, recent um, kind of winter purchases that I made. And then also there's a handout where I did a, if you don't want to watch the Facebook live as a summary with links of some of the things that um, I carry with me, the backpack and um, uh, just some thoughts on things to be prepared when you're out doing activities, whether it's walking, hiking, running, ski joring, snowshoeing, whatever it is with your dogs in the cold weather. Hmm. Uh, anybody have any other questions? You guys had a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Sarah mentioned about her dog stretching on their own. So that's what you mean by dynamic stretching, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like a play bow, you know, when they go into a play bow and they kind of go into that position on their own either, um, or you, you can reward it when they go into it on their own, or you can lure them with food to go into it. Um, that would be like the dynamic stretching. Mm -hmm. So the dog is choosing how far to like a cookie stretch. If you lure them with some food to, um, their nose, to their shoulder, their nose, to the hip, they are deciding how far to stretch. You are not physically manipulating and grabbing the body and, and pulling it into position. Hmm. So I, I know a lot of people had some real specific questions on how do I stretch this and how do I stretch that? And you know, you were saying, I have to know your dog before I can even come close to saying any of that. If um, like, let's say if I am interested in, you know, my dog and I would like to start a program um, where, could I go? Where could I find you? Where could I? Um... Yep. Um, they can go to my website. It's northeastcanineconditioning.com. Uh, it's canine is the letter K and the number nine, Northeast Canine Conditioning. But um, I also have a Facebook business page. It's Northeast Canine Conditioning. And if you click on videos, I do a Facebook live show every Friday and I've been doing it for a number of years and there's probably like 200 videos in there. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of great, great, great content in there. Um, it's not all fitness. Uh, if you're a dog trainer, I also have some business stuff in there and things to help you with your dog training business. But the majority of it is fitness. So they can go to the Northeast Canine Conditioning, the Facebook page every Friday at 8.30 p.m. is when I do the Facebook live show. Um, we also have a, a Facebook group that's uh, just open to the public. It's called Get Fit and Active with Your Dog. And we got people from all over the world and uh, sharing um, photos and videos and just really, it's more just motivational to get out and get active and do things with your dog and, and people get in there and share what they're doing. And it helps, you know, motivate us to see each other out there. And we'll, we got people from, you know, it's winter here and we got people from Australia and South Africa all over the world in there. Um, and then also uh, reach out to me. We have a, a number of different programs. Um, I have programs for just, uh, you know, from the pet dog to sport dog handlers. We have a mission ready canine program for police, military and search and rescue dog handlers. And then we also have the elite canine athlete program. And that is our most comprehensive program that could lead to becoming a certified canine athlete specialist. And that program, it's more for. Oh, oh no. We lost her. Where'd she go? She'll, she'll join us. Uh, links, yes, I will try to get those and hopefully she'll be able to come back. Not sure what happened. Uh, I, I have to tell you, this is a really great topic. I I would not hike four miles in I'm 25 degrees. <laughs> I just yeah. yeah, <laughs> if the I, I'm not sure when they lost me, but I think it was when I was talking about the elite canine athlete for dog yeah. trainers or yeah, business yeah. owners. If they go to elite canine athlete.com, uh, again, it's the elite canine, the letter K, the number nine, elite canine athlete.com, they can download the brochure. Um, that's mostly people who want to learn in depth about canine fitness, designing program, assessing dogs, and also 
working with multiple dogs and handlers, not just the dog in front of you, but if you're wanting to learn more in depth and you know, helping other people, whether it's if you're a part of a club or um, you know, a search and rescue team, or if you're a dog trainer and you're wanting to integrate canine fitness into your business, that would be the program that I would recommend because it's our most comprehensive program. Um, that's the Elite Canine Athlete Program. And then we um, on the, our, the website, you can also see the Canine Peak Performance Program. Um, and that we've had a mixture of um, pet dog, sport dog, working dog people that do that program. And um, the biggest thing if people definitely want support and they're not exactly sure which is the best way would be to reach out to me, um, message me, email me, Facebook, uh, I'm very accessible. And a lot of times I'll have a conversation with people and then we can kind of decide what would be the best program for them depending on their interests and their needs. All right. Erica, great. thanks a lot. Thank you. A great topic. We could, I mean, this is, this is, this topic, you guys, this was just a, the tip of the iceberg about can conditioning. There is, there is so much more to it, but I hope you guys uh, got a lot of information and things to think about and things to maybe implement. And sometimes what we might not do for ourselves, we do for our dogs. Like Aaron said, if there was a, a gym for dogs, we'd probably be there more often than we would be there for our, for ourselves. But with COVID, so. it is what it is. Uh, thank you all for coming out. And um, please make sure you like or follow our Facebook pages so you can keep informed of what we've got going on and the different topics we have going. So thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.